Hello and welcome again. It's Bible Scribe. Thank you so much for joining me on this important video. It feels like I've been working on this for a long time. Uh, a lot of information goes into this. The hardest part is actually figuring out what all I can put in the video so that it, it um, doesn't last for six hours. This is about the Great White Throne Judgment that is talked about in Revelation chapter 20. And what I'm doing in this video is mainly bringing you receipts. I'm going to show you everywhere that this event is talked about that I've found. There's likely many more, actually. And let me just say that this information is probably going to challenge you the same way that it did me. Uh, of course, having come to a understanding of what happened when our Savior was on earth and then after in 70 AD, when such miraculous things happened, you know, we've all been wrestling with those things, understanding those things. But then, of course, you know me and you know that the things I've talked about, my intent with my work is to stay in line with Christianity. Uh, that's why I study the church fathers. That's why I study the early Christian writings to give me more context for what the apostles were teaching, what Jesus Christ himself taught. That is what's important to all of us, or it should be. And so what this information is going to do is expose something that is also in line with the teachings of those same people, including your Savior, Jesus Christ. And it will challenge your notions. It challenged mine. And some of the conclusions we're going to talk about at the end are big. And they do shift understanding into a spot that will challenge almost every notion that's out there on the table right now in the public sphere, but also will bring all of our notions and understanding in line with most of Christianity. So I just want to say before we start, realize that what I am doing here is showing you the information. I'm showing you the places that this information is found. I'm giving you the receipts up front and then we'll talk about the conclusions. But realize at the end of this, when the conclusions come and things are shaken up and your understanding is checked, that you realize I just gave you all the receipts for what we're talking about. Trust me, it hasn't been easy for me either in this process. But with that, let's get into the information that is available on the Great White Throne Judgment. Thank you again for joining me. So let's start with just the basic reading of Revelation chapter 20, where it talks about the Great White Throne Judgment. It's, of course, where most people get their understanding of this event from. So we'll go over that very quickly and then move on to other things. But starting in verse 10 of chapter 20, it says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And this account of the Great White Throne Judgment bleeds over a little into chapter 21, so we'll read verse 1 there. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So we all know this passage pretty well if we've studied any eschatology, you're aware of it, you've read it many times likely. And I just want to bring out a few points about what we've read. This is, of course, after the little season 
after which Satan has been bound for a thousand years, is released, foments the battle of Gog and Magog by bringing the nations against the, quote, camp of the saints. And then it says that he is then cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. And John sees this great white throne, and God sat on it. And it says in verse 11, the earth and heaven fled away. That's going to become more important later on. There was found no place for them. And then he says he saw the dead, small and great, all the dead. And it also qualifies that by saying that the sea gives up its dead and death and hell give up their dead. So all dead humans are referenced in this short passage all dead humans everywhere good and evil and of course it then says they were judged according to their works based on what is written in the books that are opened all very important key points we need to take note of and at this point in history death and hell those greek words are thanatos and hades are cast into the lake of fire this would be the complete end of all death so this is one reason that we know that this event has not happened because there is still death in the world. And again, this is another point where we're going to hear a lot more about this later on. So those are the main points of Revelation 20's account of the Great White Throne Judgment. So with that basis, let's go forward and see where else this record occurs. So now let's look at what the early Christians said about the Great White Throne Judgment event that we just read about in Revelation chapter 20. It's actually quite stark and amazing. Most people don't read these writings to see these accounts and then, of course, match them with Scripture, which is exactly what we're going to do here. Clement of Rome says in his second epistle to the Corinthians, in chapter 16, verse 3, he says, But ye know that the day of judgment comes even now as a burning oven, and the powers of the heavens shall melt, and all the earth as lead melting on the fire, and then shall appear the secret and open works of men. So in that passage you see again the day of judgment. You see the mention of fire and the earth burning, the heavens melting, and then the appearance of the secret and open works of men. Of course, in Revelation, the works of men are recounted in the books that are opened before God at this judgment. Then in the same writing in chapter 17, Clement says this, For the Lord said, I come to gather together all the nations, tribes, and languages. Herein he speaks of the day of his appearing when he shall come and redeem us, each man according to his works. And the unbelievers shall see his glory and his might, and they shall be amazed when they see the kingdom of the world given to Jesus, saying, Woe unto us, for thou wast, and we knew it not, and believed not, and we obeyed not the presbyters when they told us of our salvation. And their worm shall not die, and their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be for a spectacle unto all flesh. He speaketh of that day of judgment when men shall see those among us that live ungodly lives and dealt falsely with the commandments of Jesus Christ. In that passage, again, referring to Christ gathering the nations together and then at his appearing, redeeming Christians, redeeming the righteous and judging each man according to his works. And of course, it mentions again the fire that will consume the wicked, and that at the end, even the wicked will give glory to God, and that there will be hope for Christianity in the end, those that have served God with their whole heart. In the early Christian writing, the Didache, written in the mid-first century, the early church used this writing as a, a teaching tool. But in chapter 16 of the Didache, it says this, be watchful for your life. Let your lamps not be quenched and your loins not ungirded, but be ye ready, for ye know not the hour in which your Lord cometh. For in the last days the false prophets and corruptors shall be multiplied, and the sheep shall be turned into wolves, and love shall be turned into hate. 
For as lawlessness increaseth, they shall hate one another, and shall persecute and betray. And then the world deceiver shall appear as a son of God, and shall work signs and wonders, and the earth shall be delivered into his hands. And he shall do unholy things which have never been since the world began. Then all created mankind shall come to the fire of testing, and many shall be offended and perish. But they that endure in their faith shall be saved from under the curse itself. And then shall the signs of the truth appear, first a sign of a rift in heaven, then a sign of a voice of a trumpet, and thirdly a resurrection of the dead. Yet not of all, but as it was said, the Lord shall come and all his saints with him. Then shall the world see the Lord coming upon the clouds of heaven. So in that passage you see towards the end that lawlessness increases. Satan essentially has sway over the world. He's called the world deceiver. The earth would be delivered into Satan's hands for a time. But then there would be a rift in heaven, the voice of a trumpet, and a resurrection of the dead. Of course, matching what we read in Revelation. Then the Lord would come upon the clouds of heaven with his saints. This seems to match some things we've heard in other passages. We've read in other passages about, quote, the coming of the Lord. So I would ask that you withhold judgment on what is happening, what is being talked about until the end of the video. There's a lot more of this to come, a lot more. The next writing we're going to look at is the Apocalypse of Peter. And in this portion of the writing, it's Jesus talking, saying these things. It says, Behold now what shall come upon them in the last days, when the day of God and the day of the decision of the judgment of God cometh. From the east and to the west, all the children of men will be gathered together before my Father that lives forever. And he shall command hell to open its bars of adamant, and give up all that is therein. For all things come to pass on the day of decision, on the day of judgment, at the word of God. And as all things were done when he created the world, and commanded all that is therein, and it was done, even so shall it be in the last days. For all things are possible with God. And soul and spirit shall the great Uriel, give them at the commandment of God, for he hath God set over the rising again of the dead at the day of judgment. And this shall come at the day of judgment upon them that have fallen away from faith in God and that have committed sin. Floods of fire shall be let loose, and darkness and obscurity shall come up and clothe and veil the whole world, and the waters shall be changed into coals of fire, and all that is in them shall burn, and the sea shall become fire. Under the heaven shall be a sharp fire that cannot be quenched and flows to fulfill the judgment of wrath. And the stars shall fly in pieces by flames of fire, as if they had not been created. And the powers or firmaments of heaven shall pass away for lack of water and shall be as though they had not been. And so soon as the whole creation dissolves, the men that are in the east shall flee unto the west, unto the east, they that are in the south shall flee to the north, and they that are in the south. And in all places shall the wrath of a fearful fire overtake them, and an unquenchable flame driving them shall bring them unto the judgment of wrath. Then shall they all behold me coming upon an eternal cloud of brightness, and the angels of God that are with me shall sit, and I shall sit upon my throne of glory at the right hand of my heavenly Father. And he shall set a crown upon my head, and when the nations behold it, they shall weep, every nation apart. So we are getting more and more detail as we go here. Now, as far as this great white throne judgment, many things are added by the apocalypse of Peter here. It says that all mankind would be gathered before God at this judgment. That even the dead of Hades would be brought forth, resurrected to stand before God in judgment at this time. And it mentions the creation dissolving. It mentions this, and we've seen this now in a couple of these passages. We'll continue to see this. The creation dissolves. We'll learn more about what that means in a second. But it appears from this passage that all men will flee the fire coming from heaven, but will not be able to escape it. 
and that at some point in this passage now, it mentions Christ coming with his angels and sitting upon his throne next to the Father as a part of this judgment, and then being crowned and the nations, the wicked, weeping over his crowning as king over all the earth. In the writing, The Discourse of Abaddon, in chapter 23, 25, and 26, we get more detail about the great white throne judgment as well. In chapter 23, it says this, On the day of the holy resurrection, I shall come upon the clouds of heaven, and every eye shall see me, and all the peoples and tongues shall lament. And thousands of thousands and tens of thousands of tens of thousands of angels shall be before me. And my cross shall advance before me like a symbol of sovereignty before a king. According to what I have said unto you, the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and with that which is of his Father and all his angels with him. I will command my chief archangel, the holy Michael, and he shall blow a blast on his trumpet in the valley of Jehoshaphat that those who are dead may arise incorruptible, and that there shall not remain on the earth one soul that shall not rise up, from Adam the first, even to the last man that will be born into the world. And they will rise up in the valley of Jehoshaphat, so that each one may receive in his body according to what he has done, whether it is good or evil. And they will stand there in fear and trembling, awaiting the Spirit of my Father." So in this section, the dead are raised and brought before God, and the place that that occurs is called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. This seems to be corollary to the Valley of Decision in many texts and the Valley of Jezreel. All these places seem to be one and the same. And in chapter 26 of this same writing, it says this, And forthwith I shall utter curses upon Satan that day. I will make them to seize him, that is the angels, and to fetter him in the bonds which cannot be broken, and I will curse that lying prophet who has led astray the nations, the Antichrist, the son of perdition. And they shall cast them into the lake of fire which burneth with fire and sulfur, together with all those who have been their followers in the world, and they shall never enjoy repose, day or night. Their worm shall not die, and their fire shall not be quenched. So in this writing, we get this mention now of Satan, of course, just as Revelation chapter 20 mentions Satan being cast in the lake of fire. But this writing also mentions the, quote, lying prophet or the Antichrist, the son of perdition, who is also cast in the lake of fire with Satan at this time. Now, in the Christian Sibyllines, now these are writings that were written in Greek at the, uh, around or before the time of Christ and held by the Christians in high regard because they, of course, the prophecies in them matched what they understood from the apostles' teaching and from Christ's teaching. And so the Christian Sibyllines in Book 8 mention this same event. So let's read here in Book 8, starting in line 205 and running to about line 243. It says, He shall make earth desert. But there shall be a resurrection of the dead, and swift running of the lame, and the deaf shall hear, the blind see, and they that speak not shall speak. And to all shall life be common, and riches too, earth the same for all, not divided by walls or fences, will bear fruit more abundant. Springs of sweet wine and white milk and of honey it will give. But when God changes the seasons, making winter summer, then are all the oracles fulfilled. For when the world has perished and the eternal comes, fire shall hold sway in the darkness and silence in the midst of the night. Jesus Christ, Son of God, Redeemer, Cross, earth shall sweat when the sign of judgment shall appear. From heaven shall come the eternal King who is to be. When he comes, he shall judge all flesh and the whole world. And mortals, faithful and faithless, shall see God most high with the saints at the end of time. He shall judge on his throne the soul of flesh-clothed men. When all the world becomes dry land and thorns, men shall cast down their idols and all their wealth, and the fire shall burn up earth, heaven, and sea. Ranging abroad, he shall break the gates of Hades' prison. 
Then shall all flesh of the dead come to the light of freedom, that is, the saints. The lawless the fire shall torment for ages. Whatever a man wrought secretly, then shall he speak all openly. For God will open dark breasts with his lights. There shall be wailing from all and gnashing of teeth. The light of the sun shall be eclipsed, the dances of the stars. Heaven he will roll up, and the light of the moon shall perish. He will raise aloft the chasms, lay low the high places of the hills. No more shall baneful height be seen among men. Mountains shall be level with plains, and all the sea shall no more have voyages. For earth shall then be parched with its springs, and the foaming rivers run dry. A trumpet from heaven shall send forth the sound of great lamentation, mourning defilement of limbs and a world's calamity. Then shall a gaping earth display the abyss of Tartarus. All kings shall come to God's judgment seat. From heaven shall flow a river of fire and brimstone. So this passage confirming again many of these things, the fire flowing from the throne of God in heaven and then consuming the earth, the wicked being brought to God's judgment seat. These comments in this passage about making mountains flat and raising valleys, essentially making the earth smooth. Now that's actually said, you'll remember that probably in other places in the Bible. Of course, most people write that off as a symbolic language or hyperbole. But apparently in many of these texts, the exact same thing is described in detail. And as we continue to go, you'll see this more and more. Now we come to the second apocalypse of John. Sometimes it's called the Apocryphal Book of Revelation. And in fact, this entire writing is all about the Great White Throne Judgment, the whole thing. So it gives a lot of detail that other writings do not and fleshes out our understanding of this event. Let's read a few select pieces as we go throughout this text. I won't read the whole thing to you. Starting in the first chapter, After the taking up of our Lord Jesus Christ, I, John, was alone on Mount Tabor, where also he showed us his undefiled Godhead. And this is a mention of the transfiguration. And as I was not able to stand, I fell upon the ground and prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, who has deemed me worthy to be thy servant, hear my voice and teach me about thy coming. When thou shalt come to the earth, what will happen? So that's the introduction to this writing, and the entire writing is Christ's answer to John about what will happen at the end of days. Now in chapter 2, he mentions a book. It says, And I directed my sight, and I saw a book lying, of the thickness, methought, of seven mountains. And the length of it, the mind of man cannot comprehend, having seven seals. And I said, O Lord my God, reveal to me what is written in this book. And he says, In this book which you see, there have been written the things in heaven, and the things in the earth, and the things in the abyss, and the judgments and righteousness of all the human race. Again, this is a reference to the same book that's mentioned in Revelation, that's opened at the great white throne judgment, that contains the deeds, recorded deeds, of all mankind for all of history. And of course, this book, just the idea that this book exists in heaven, means that there is a beginning and an end to the deeds of mankind on earth that would be recorded. Uh, of course, that, that conflicts with views that say that the earth will go on forever. And of course, most of what we're talking about in this video conflicts with that view. John says, Lord, when shall these things come to pass, and what do those times bring? And Jesus answers and says, there shall be in that time abundance of corn and wine such as has never been upon the earth, nor shall ever be until those times come. And in the following year there shall not be found upon the face of earth even half a coinix of corn or half a jar of wine. So a time of plenty followed by a short time or a year of, of lack of famine across the earth. Then in chapter 3 it says, then shall appear the denier, this would be Satan, and he who is set apart in the darkness, who is called Antichrist. This would be a reference to the false prophet. And it continues and says about the Antichrist that he shall be exalted even to heaven, but would be cast down to Hades, making false displays. 
and he will love most of all the nation of the Hebrews, and the righteous shall hide themselves and flee to mountains and caves during this time. And then he says, I will make the heaven brazen so that it shall not give moisture upon the earth, and I will hide the clouds in secret places so that they shall not bring moisture upon the earth. So again, that famine time period, uh, lack of rain, etc. In chapter 4, it says, For three years shall those times be, meaning these times of lack on the earth, these times of famine, where the Antichrist and Satan are ruling the earth. And this is a reference to Psalm 89, 44 and 45. But he says, As said the prophet David, his throne has thou broken down to the ground. Speaking of the Antichrist and or Satan. Thou hast shortened the days of his time. Thou hast poured shame upon him. And then he says, I shall send forth Enoch and Elijah to convict him. And they shall show him to be a liar and a deceiver. And he shall kill them at the altar. As said the prophet, they shall offer calves upon thine altar. So just note a few things that we've just talked about. That this Antichrist person figure will favor the Hebrew nation, the nation of Hebrews. And then it says, he will slay Enoch and Elijah, the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11. He will slay them at the altar. Well, if there's an altar, there must be a temple at that time, possibly a rebuilt temple. And then it mentions, as the prophet said, they shall offer calves upon thine altar. That sounds strikingly familiar to some modern day events going on. Then in chapter 5, John asks, Lord, and after that, what will come to pass? And his answer is that then all the human race will die, and there will not be a living man upon all of the earth. And then I will send forth my angels. They will take the ram's horns that lie upon the cloud. Michael and Gabriel shall go forth out of the heaven and sound with those horns, as the prophet David foretold, with the voice of a trumpet of horn. And the voice of the trumpet shall be heard from one quarter of the world to the other, and from the voice of that trumpet all the earth will be shaken, as the prophet foretold, again, from the Psalms. And at the voice of the bird every plant shall arise, that is, at the voice of the archangel all the human race shall arise. So again, this is the resurrection of the dead that occurs at the time of the great white throne judgment. And of course, that is heralded by the blow of the last trumpet by Michael and Gabriel. Then skipping to chapter 9, it says, Then I will send forth my angels over the face of all the earth, and they will lift off the earth everything honorable and everything precious, and the venerable and holy images, and the glorious and precious crosses, and the sacred vessels of the churches, and the divine and sacred books, and all the precious and holy things shall be lifted up by clouds into the air. And then I will order to be lifted up the great and venerable scepter. Now he's talking actually about the cross here. On which I stretched forth my hands, and all the orders of my angels shall do reverence to it. Along with them we shall be snatched up in clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We can only assume that John here is talking about the Christians. And then shall come forth from every evil spirit, both in the earth and the abyss, wherever they are in the face of all the earth, from the rising of the sun to the setting. And they shall be united to him that is served by the devil, that is, the Antichrist. And they shall be lifted up upon the clouds. So the entire human race, dead and alive, are lifted up in cloud. And then in chapter 10, it says, I shall send forth my angels over the face of the earth, and they shall burn up the earth, 8,500 cubits. And the great mountains shall be burned up, and all the rocks shall be melted and shall become as dust, and every tree will be burnt up. And there shall no longer be upon the face of all the earth anything moving, and the earth will be without motion. So again, referring back to the other passages, both in the Bible and other writings that have said that the hills will be made low, the valleys will rise, and everything will be even. Everything will be cleared off, so to speak. And all life will be consumed. There will be no motion. It will be still, and it will be silent on the earth at this time. 
Then in chapter 12, he says, Then shall the earth be cleansed from sin, and all the earth shall be filled with a sweet smell, because I am about to come down upon the earth. So Christ is going to come down then. All the earth is prepared for this judgment. It is laid low. It is leveled and cleansed from sin. And he says, Then I will come forth with power and great glory, and every eye in the clouds shall see me. And then every knee shall bend of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth. And then the heaven shall remain empty, and I will come down upon the earth, and all that is in the air shall be brought down upon the earth, and all the human race and every evil spirit along with Antichrist. And they shall all be set before me naked and chained by the neck. In chapter 14, he mentions a few things about the heavenly bodies. He says, The stars of heaven shall fall, the moon shall be hidden, the light of the sun will be withheld, the heavens will be dissolved, the earth will be rent, half of the sea will disappear, Hades will be uncovered. In chapter 15, he tells us that the first to be judged would be the unclean spirits along with the adversary, meaning Satan. And then would be judged Adam's race, the nations, both the Greeks who have believed in idols and the sun and the stars and have defiled and have defiled faith by heresy and who have not believed in the holy resurrection and who have not confessed the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Them then he will send away into Hades. As the prophet David again foretold, he mentions Psalms where it says, Let the sinners be turned into Hades and all the nations that forget God. Then in chapter 17, he says that the race of the Hebrews would be examined, those who nailed him to the tree like a malefactor. And he says they will go away into Tartarus, as the prophet David again foretold. And then in chapter 18, he says that the Christians would be examined who had received baptism and the righteous will come at his command and the angels shall go and collect them from among the sinners. And all the righteous would be placed on his right hand and would shine like the sun. And now in chapter 25, he says, go and sound the trumpet for the angels of cold and snow and ice to bring together every kind of wrath upon those that stand on the left. Note that it mentioned the Christians on the right, and these are the wicked or the impious, the unrighteous, on the left. And it says these will go away into everlasting punishment. And in chapter 20 he says, Lord, where will the righteous dwell? And he heard a voice saying to him, Then shall paradise be revealed. The whole world and paradise will be made one, and the righteous will be on the face of all the earth with my angels. As the Holy Spirit foretold through the prophet David, the righteous shall inherit the earth. He's saying that statement from David and from Christ was about this final judgment. The righteous inherit the new earth, the remade earth, and they will dwell therein forever and ever. In chapter 22, he says, After that there is no pain, there is no grief, there is no groaning. There is no recollection of evils. And he finishes up in chapters 23 and 24. He says, Again I heard this voice saying to me, Behold, thou hast heard all these things, righteous John. Deliver them to faithful men, that they may also teach others, and not think lightly of them. Nor cast our pearls before swine, lest perchance they should trample them with their feet. So, According to the writers of this passage, of this writing, this was a very valued teaching about the great white throne judgment, about the, quote, holy resurrection, about the coming of the Lord, uh, and the judgment of all mankind. Now, you might think that because of everything we've gone through, that this was only something perhaps that the Christians wrote about, because that's the writings we just went through. But actually, now we're going back to Jewish and pre-Christian writings that include information about the great white throne judgment. So yes, there was writings before Christ, 
hundreds, maybe a thousands of years before Christ about this same judgment. Let's look at a few of those sources. In the book of Jubilees, it says this in chapter 4, In the eleventh Jubilee, Jared took to himself a wife, and her name was Baraka, the daughter of Rasujal, the daughter of his father's brother, in the fourth week of this Jubilee, and she bare him a son in the fifth week, in the fourth year of the Jubilee, and he called his name Enoch. And what was and what will be he saw in a vision in his sleep, as it will happen to the children of men throughout their generations until the day of judgment. He saw and understood everything and wrote his testimony and placed the testimony on earth for all the children of men and their generations. So this seems to be a small mention, but this day of judgment uh, mentioned in Jubilees that Enoch would prophesy about. So let's go to the book of Enoch and see what is said about this same event. The book of Enoch in chapter 94, starting in verse 14, says this, And after that, in the ninth week, the righteous judgment shall be revealed to the whole world. This is a prophecy about the ages of earth, and they're given to Enoch in a discussion of weeks. And all the weeks up to this point have recounted the entire history of the earth, and so this would be at the end of the history of the earth. It says, The righteous judgment shall be revealed to the whole world, and all the works of the godless shall vanish from the earth, and all the world shall be written down for destruction. And after this, in the tenth week, in the seventh part, there shall be the great eternal judgment, in which he will execute vengeance amongst the angels. And the first heaven shall depart and pass away, and a new heaven shall appear, and all the powers of the heavens shall give sevenfold light. And after that there will be many weeks without number for ever, and all shall be in goodness and righteousness, and sin shall be no more mentioned for ever. And of course this parallels the things we've already read about the judgment, the judgment of the angels, the judgment of mankind, heaven passing away, the earth being written down, quote-unquote, for destruction, and then there being, after this time, weeks without end, weeks without number forever. Time goes on forever after this, and it is in goodness and in righteousness, and there is no sin any longer. The book of Second Esdras actually talks quite a bit about the judgment, in chapter 7, particularly, talks about it and says this, And the world shall be turned into the old silence seven days, like as in the former judgments. And in former judgments, we can only assume to mean things like the flood of Noah, etc. So that no man shall remain, he says. And after seven days, the world that yet awaketh not shall be raised up, and that shall die that is corrupt. And the earth shall restore those that are asleep in her, and so shall the dust those that dwell in silence, and the secret places shall deliver those souls which were committed to them. And the Most High shall appear on the seat of judgment, and misery will pass away, and the long suffering shall have an end. But judgment only shall remain. Truth shall stand, and faith shall wax strong. And the work shall follow, and the reward shall be showed. And the good deeds shall be of force, and wicked deeds shall bear no rule. The pit of torment shall appear, and opposite it shall be the place of rest. Now just think of that when we remember back to the other passages that talked about the, the good, the righteous being on the right side, and the wicked being on the left. Again, this says the pit of torment is on one side, and on the opposite side is the place of rest. And the furnace of hell shall be disclosed, and opposite it the paradise of delight. Then the Most High will say to the nations who have been raised from the dead, Look now and understand whom you have denied, whom you have not served, whose commandments you have despised. Look on this side and that. Here are delight and rest, and there are fire and torments. Thus he will speak to them on the day of judgment, a day that has no sun or moon or stars. And then here's an interesting passage that's part of this chapter. Esdras asks this, he says, If I have found favor in your sight, show further to me your servant, whether on the day of judgment the righteous will be able to intercede for the ungodly or to entreat the Most High for them. 
So this is an interesting question. Will the righteous on the day of judgment be able to petition God on behalf of some of the people that will be counted with the wicked because they did not accept the son? And here's what the answer is. He answered and said, Since you have found favor in my sight, I will show you this. The day of judgment is decisive and displays to all the seal of truth. So no one shall ever pray for another on that day, neither shall anyone lay a burden on another. For then shall all bear their own righteousness and unrighteousness. He continues this thought in chapter 8 and says this, The Most High has made this world, meaning earth, for many, but the world to come for very few. I will tell thee a similitude, Esdras, as when you ask the earth, it shall say unto thee, that it gives much mold whereof earthen vessels are made, but little dust that gold comes of. Even so is the course of this present world. There be many created, but few shall be saved. Another writing that talks about this exact same event again is the Sibylline Oracles. Now you heard from the Christian Sibyllines before in the part about early Christian writings. This is different. These are Greek writings from Greek oracles or prophets that was recorded centuries before Christ came. So it's interesting that this corpus of literature speaks to the exact same event that we're seeing in all these other writings. But in the Sibylline Oracles in Book 2, and these are separated by lines, so we're looking at lines 190 through about 338 in the, in the translation that I'm using, it says this, Woe unto all that are found with great child in that day, and give suck to infants, and to them that dwell by the sea. Woe to them that shall behold that day, for a dark mist will cover the boundless world of the east and the west and north and south. And then shall a great river of flaming fire flow from heaven and consume all places. The earth and the great ocean and the gray sea, lakes and rivers and fountains, and merciless Hades and the pole of heaven. But the lights of heaven shall melt together in one and into a void or desolate shape. For the stars shall all fall from heaven into the sea, and all souls of men shall gnash at their teeth as they burn in the river of brimstone and the rush of fire in the blazing plain, and ashes shall cover all things. And then shall all the elements of the world be laid waste, air, earth, sea, light poles, day and nights. Now when the immortal angels of the undying God knowing all the evil deeds they have wrought aforetime. Then out of the misty darkness they shall bring all the souls of men to judgment unto the seat of God the immortal, the great. For he only is incorruptible, himself the Almighty, who shall be the judge of mortal men. Then shall the great angel Uriel break the monstrous bars framed of unyielding and unbroken adamant of the brazen gates of Hades and cast them down straightway and bring forth to judgment all the sorrowful forms, yea, of the ghosts of the ancient titans and of the giants, and all whom the flood overtook. And when he shall overcome fate and raise the dead, then shall Adonai Sabaoth, the high thunderer, sit on his heavenly throne, and set upon the great pillar, and Christ himself, the undying unto the undying, shall come in the clouds, in glory with the pure angels, and shall sit on the seat on the right of the Great One, judging the life of the godly and the walk of ungodly men. And then he talks in a section about the wicked and how they will be judged, and it says, And then shall they cast them down into the darkness of night, into Gehenna, among the beasts of hell, many and frightful, where is darkness without measure. And it talks then about the Christians, it says, But the residue which have cared for justice and good deeds, yea, and godliness and righteous thoughts, shall angels bear up and carry through the flaming river unto light, and life without care, where is the immortal path of the great God, and three fountains of wine and honey and milk, and the earth, common to all, not parted out with walls or fences, shall then bring forth of her own accord much fruit and life, and wealth shall be common and undistributed. So this is talking about the new earth, that there will be no walls, no fences, no borders, and the earth will again start to bring forth fruit 
and all life and wealth will not be distributed. It will be common to all men. Now, this text actually gives a slight difference from the last one. We read in Second Esdras that it didn't seem there would be given any leeway or ability for the righteous to petition God on behalf of the sinners. But this text says something just slightly different, so let's read that. It says, And unto them the godly shall the Almighty and immortal God grant another boon, when they shall ask it of him. He shall grant them to save men out of the fierce fire and the eternal gnashing of teeth. And this will he do, for he will gather them again out of the everlasting flame and remove them else whither, sending them for the sake of his people unto another life, eternal and immortal. In the Elysian plain where are the long waves of the Acherusian lake, exhaustless and deep-bosomed. So this writing saying that the godly, the righteous, will actually be able to petition God on behalf of some of those who are in the flames of hell and perhaps bring them out into an immortal life, into a certain space in heaven, a certain place. Um, it's mentioned the Elysian Plain and the Acherusian Lake. The lake, Acherusian Lake, is mentioned in other writings as the crystal lake that washes humanity clean of sin. So, uh, very interesting statements there, but again, this writing kind of conflicting with the other one saying that there may be a chance for petition of the righteous for the sinners uh, in this great white throne judgment scenario. So you can see from these writings that were pre-Christ, that, that were contemporary with some of the scriptures even, some of the Old Testament scriptures, and some of these referencing things in, for instance, the Psalms of David and other prophecies that echo the exact same event over and over and over again. I hope you can see that both during the time of Christ and thereafter, and now way before Christ, there was the prophecies, the, the stories, the, the telling of this event that would come at the end of history, the Great White Throne Judgment. So I thought at this point, now that we've seen all these other writings that talk about this event, we did read Revelation chapter 20 in the beginning, but you might be asking yourself, well, is this just something that these other writers wrote about that they kind of like put together, but wasn't really in the scriptures? Well, that's not the case. And so what we're going to do now is go back to the scriptures to see all the different places throughout the Bible that talk about this same event. In John chapter 5, verses 26 through 29, it says this, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So this passage, at the sound of Christ's voice, that all in the graves would come forth. Now, there can be argument over whether you think this happened at a certain time or not or whatever, but this seems to be inclusive, that all would come forth at the sound of the voice of Christ. And that seems to be what is talked about in these other writings we've already talked about. Now, even in Job, in the oldest book of the Bible, so to speak, chapter 38 mentions something that might actually be a reference to this event of the Great White Throne Judgment. So starting in verse 12, and this is God speaking to Job. Uh, once Job has kind of questioned God and God is now giving him a response, he says, Hast thou commanded the morning since the days, and caused the day spring to know its place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it? It is turned as clay to the seal, and they stand as a garment. And from the wicked their light is withholden, and the high arm shall be broken. Now, this 
little passage, and, and there's nothing else in Job really that speaks to this. This little passage seems to echo what we're talking about with the great white throne judgment. He speaks of taking hold of the ends of the earth and shaking the wicked out of the earth. Now, all the other passages we've read have talked about all of the wicked coming up out of the earth to stand before God in judgment. It mentions turning as clay to the seal and they, meaning the wicked, standing as a garment. Now, that's interesting just because clay is usually a reference to humanity, the uh, clay that was used to form Adam. But then it says they're all standing before God, essentially, in verse 14. So again, this reference seems to be to the judgment scenario that's being talked about. And at the end, it says that the high arm will be broken. This is a, a statement, a phrase that means the proud will be made low. So in judgment, the, the proud, the kings, the nations will be brought low by judgment. Now in the book of Isaiah, chapter 65, it's a well-known prophetic passage, but it does talk about the same stuff that is in all of these other texts. So let's read in verse 15 and following. And ye shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen. For the Lord God shall slay thee, and call his servants by another name. That he who blesses himself in the earth will bless himself in the God of truth. And he that swears in the earth will swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten, and because they are hid from my eyes. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. But ye be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that has not fulfilled his days. For the youth shall be a hundred years, and the sinner who dies at a hundred years shall also be accursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them, and plant vineyards, and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build, and another inhabit. They shall not plant, and another eat. For as the days of a tree are as the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble. For they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. And dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. In this passage again, starting off with the new heavens and the new earth. And this passage is definitely related to Israel. Uh, and, and it is part of God's promises to Israel, of course, that they would be taken care of after the resurrection. That they would enjoy the fruits of their labors. These mentions of they would not labor in vain. That the work of their hands would bring forth produce. Uh, these were promises God did make to his people Israel and could be fulfilled through the events of the great white throne judgment and afterwards when the new heavens and the new earth are completed and they can live there on the new earth with God and Christ himself. And these mentions, of course, in verse 25 of the wolf and the lamb and the lion, these are all representatives of the tribes of Israel. They will all live and work together. Now, in 2 Peter chapter 3, we see a stark mention of the great white throne judgment. Of course, many people, again, I want to stress that many people confuse these prophecies. They mix them up, put them on top of each other. And this passage is, I think, one of those where people misapply it. But this does seem to be talking about the same events. Starting in verse 4, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. Of course, talking about Noah's flood. And then he speaks of another prophecy. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, kept in store 
reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of the Lord, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. This, of course, paralleling exactly the statements of the great white throne judgment event. The heavens and earth would be destroyed by fire and remade. And that we, according to his promise, this is Peter saying that Jesus himself promised this to us, we would look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. The current earth, there is not righteousness in the current earth. Uh, it does not dwell uninhibited as is being talked about in this passage. But in the new heavens and new earth, when all sin is done away with, righteousness will dwell forever. Now there's an interesting mention a couple times in the scriptures about the days of Noah. In Matthew 24, verse 37 is one of these places. It says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And this is right after in verse 35 where he says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Then mentioning the days of Noah, he says, For as in the days that were before the flood they ate and drank, they married and they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So again, the mention of heaven and earth passing away in this passage seems to indicate something related to the new heaven and new earth. Now we also have 1 Peter chapter 3, which talks about this same thing. In verse 20, it says, Which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. The like figure, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so I don't know if you remember the reference to the passage we read just a minute ago in these other writings, but it said that the baptism was one of the things, baptism and obedience to God was one of the things that Christ was looking for at the great white throne judgment for the righteous. And so this passage in 1 Peter 3 is saying that just as eight souls were saved by water in the flood of Noah, the same kind of principle of signification applies between baptism and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That by water you are saved. By the water of baptism you are saved in the resurrection. Again, referring to the resurrection, the holy resurrection at the great white throne judgment. Now there's another concept in all of these writings about the judging of the living and the dead the judging of what they call the quick and the dead. You've probably heard that phrase many times before in your studies. We can start in 2 Timothy 4 verse 1 where it says, I charge thee therefore God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. So again, this reference to the appearing, the coming of Christ, at which time all of mankind would be judged all of the quick and the dead, the living and the dead, would be judged at the time of Christ's coming. We have the same thing in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 5. It says, Who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? Another reference to this, the quick and the dead, again, it is a specific reference to what happens at the great white throne judgment when all the living and all the dead are judged before God and Christ. Now, Tertullian actually writes about this in his writing against Praxius, chapter 2, verse 3. He says this, Him, meaning Christ, we believe to have been sent by the Father into the Virgin, and to have been born of her, being both man and God, the Son of man and the Son of God, and to have been called by the name of Jesus Christ. We believe him to have suffered, died, and been buried, 
according to the scriptures, and after he had been raised again by the Father and taken back to heaven, to be sitting at the right hand of the Father, and that he will come to judge the quick and the dead, who sent also from heaven, from the Father, according to his own promise, the Holy Ghost, the paraclete, the sanctifier of the faith of those who believe in the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. So again, that mention of judging the quick and the dead, and that Christ would be the one to do it at the end of time. Now in the early Christian writing, the Acts of Peter, chapter 3, verse 17, it says this, But his device has had no success. And I believe this is Peter talking about the magician Simon Magus. For my God has manifested it to me, to the end that thou shouldest not be deceived, neither perish in hell, for those sins which thou hast committed ungodly and contrary to God, who is full of all truth and the righteous judge of the quick and the dead. And there is none other hope of life unto men save through him, by whom those things which thou hast lost are recovered unto thee, and now do thou gain thy own soul. So again, calling God the judge of the quick and the dead, Again, in most of these texts, that attribute is given to both God and to Christ, because God has, of course, given that authority to Christ. They both have the authority. We also see this referenced in the epistle of Polycarp to the Philippians, chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Wherefore, gird up your loins, and serve God in fear and truth, forsaking the vain and empty talking and the error of many. For that ye have believed on him that has raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, and gave unto him a glory and a throne on his right hand, unto whom all things were made subject that are in heaven and that are on the earth, to whom every creature that has breath doeth service, who cometh as judge of quick and dead, whose blood God will require of them that are disobedient unto him. So again, Jesus at his coming, judging both the living and the dead. The epistle of Barnabas, chapter 7, verse 2, says, If then the Son of God, being Lord and future judge of the quick and the dead, suffered that his wound might give us life, let us believe that the Son of God could not suffer except for our sakes. Just again on reference to this idea that Jesus Christ was the judge to come of the quick and the dead. And the epistle of Barnabas was written uh, after Christ and after 70 AD. Uh, actually, many of these writings were. Um, so it definitely did not refer to 70 AD as this coming and judgment of the quick and dead. Clement, in his second epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 1, says, Brethren, we ought so to think of Jesus Christ as of God, as the judge of the quick and the dead. Now, there's another concept in many writings, including the scriptures, of the right and the left, the right hand of Christ and the left hand of Christ. There's a few different places that mention this. The most well-known is going to be in Matthew. So in chapter 25, starting in verse 31, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all his holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then shall he say also to them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. So if you remember the writings we've already read now about the wicked being placed at the left hand of Christ during the judgment, and that, that at the left hand of Christ would be Hades and would be the pit of torment, but at the right hand of Christ would be the righteous and would be the Garden of Eden, paradise, and would be rest that that is the image we get of the, the separation of the sheep and goats during the final judgment, the great white throne judgment. Now, I just found it interesting that in John chapter 21, 
where the disciples are fishing and then Jesus tells them how to change their fishing so they'll catch some fish. The disciples are coming in from the shore and in John 21, 5, Jesus says unto them, children, have ye any meat? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the ship and ye will find. So they cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fishes in the net. And I had to wonder if, you know, this is, they were searching on the wrong side of the boat, the left side where the wicked essentially would be represented. They were not finding any fish. They were fishers of men, remember? And so Christ tells them, well, fish on the right side amongst the righteous, essentially, and they catch so many fish in their nets, they can't pull them in. Seems to be a reference to this same concept. And another interesting reference in Ezekiel chapter one, I, I found this as well and thought this does seem to have some relationship. When it is describing the creatures around the throne of God in Ezekiel one verse five and following, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, and every one had four faces and every one four wings. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. So it says that these cherubim, these living creatures had faces on the different sides of their head, four faces. But on the right side was a lion. And of course, on the right hand of Christ during the judgment is the righteous. And on the left side was an ox. Of course, an ox or a bull or a ram represents Satan, represents wickedness. And so on the left hand of Christ is the wicked during the final judgment. I'm not 100% sure about this correlation, but it seems to be there. It seems to be that there is some relationship. Now, another interesting possible correlation is when Christ is on the cross and there are thieves on either side of him. It says this in Matthew chapter 23, verse 33 and following. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And one of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and save us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, Verily I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now it doesn't say here in this passage that the, that the thief that rebukes the other one and asks Christ to remember him is on Christ's right side and the other one on the left. It doesn't say that, but it just makes you wonder. Perhaps that was the case. Now again, I wanted to reiterate that you know me and you know the way I study and the, the importance I place on conformity to especially the early church in my beliefs and in the things I understand from scriptures and writings. So I guess what the term I'm using for that now in some regard is orthodoxy. Uh, belief systems that fall outside of orthodoxy in relationship to the early church and the apostolic church, uh, to me, are problematic. That's why I have a big problem with full preterism. That's why I have a big problem with many different eschatologies or belief systems that are outside church orthodoxy. They just do not conform to any of what is believed in church history. Uh, so that's one check I use for myself when I'm studying. Does it correlate in some way or any way with what we do know about apostolic Christian church history. And what we're going to see now is we're going to go over some church creeds that have preserved the idea of the great white throne judgment that we've talked about now in all these different writings. So now still, if you somehow believe that the things we have talked about are, are 
some kind of anomaly or, or not mainline. They are, and they were preserved throughout Christianity through history. So we're going to go over some church creeds that contain information about the Great White Throne Judgment, specifically. We're going to start with the Nicene Creed. And a portion of the Nicene Creed says this, The third day he, meaning Christ, rose again, according to the Scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. That's that statement of the quick and the dead again. His kingdom will never end. So this is the Nicene Creed agreed upon by the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, stating that they had an acknowledgement and an expectation of the great white throne judgment when Christ would come with glory and judge all mankind, the living and the dead, and that then his kingdom would never end. In the same time period, about the 300s AD, was the Athanasian Creed. And again, while I don't believe or totally agree with all the things we're reading here, for instance, the Athanasian Creed, I disagree with points of the Athanasian Creed. I'm just showing you that throughout history, Christianity preserved the idea of the coming of Christ and God in judgment at the final great white throne judgment. But the Athanasian Creed says this, he suffered for our salvation, meaning Christ, of course. He descended to hell. He arose from the dead. He ascended to heaven. He is seated at the Father's right hand. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. At his coming, all people will arise bodily and give an accounting of their own deeds. Those who have done good will enter eternal life, and those who have done evil will enter eternal fire. So again, this Athanasian Creed about the same time, the 4th century, as the Nicene Creed, saying the same things about the Great White Throne Judgment. But then even as we go forward into history, to the Apostles' Creed, it says this, On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the quick and the dead, the living and the dead. Again, the same reference to what Christ will do, at the Great White Throne Judgment. And if that wasn't enough, even the Westminster Confession of Faith has very specific references to the Great White Throne Judgment. In chapter 32, At the last day, such as are found alive shall not die, but be changed, and all the dead shall be raised up with the selfsame bodies, and none other, although with different qualities, which shall be united again to their souls forever. The bodies of the unjust shall, by the power of Christ, be raised to dishonor, the bodies of the just by his Spirit unto honor, and be made conformable to his own glorious body. Then in chapter 33, God appointed a day wherein he will judge the world in righteousness by Jesus Christ, to whom all power and judgment is given of the Father in which day not only the apostate angels shall be judged, but likewise all persons that have lived upon earth shall appear before the tribunal of Christ to give an account of their thoughts, words, and deeds, and to receive according to what they have done in the body, whether good or evil. As Christ would have us to be certainly persuaded that there shall be a day of judgment, both to deter all men from sin and for the greater consolation of the godly in their adversity, so will he have that day unknown to men, that they may shake off all carnal security and be always watchful, because they know not at what hour the Lord will come, and may be ever prepared to say, Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. So again, the Westminster Confession of the Faith coming straight from the Reformers of Martin Luther's day, saying all the things we've been talking about, about the judgment of all mankind, by Christ and his Father at the end of time. It's all there, and it's all accounted for in each of these creeds that we've now read. All right, now we've gone through all the writings that I wanted to go through. Uh, there would be more. I just, you know, at some point I have to cut myself off because the research just goes on and on forever. Um, I know there are many more early Christian writers that have 
written about this. Uh, I only found a few and moved on because apparently, as you've seen, it's very ubiquitous. This idea is everywhere. Uh, so I just had to cut it off at some point. But what I wanted to do now is go through kind of a laundry list of exactly what is the agenda of the Great White Throne Judgment event. What happens and in what order. There are some of these writings that were a lot more detailed than others. And so what I did was I correlated all the writings together. Now I'm not going to give you all the references for every little piece of this. Uh, I would simply recommend that you read these writings that we've gone over today if you want to do that yourself. I have done it to some extent, but it became so uh, so exhaustive, so taxing and time consuming. I decided to, to put that aside and simply go through the list of things that happen during the judgment. So we'll go through these step by step. Number one is a time of abundance. If you remember us talking about that, there will be a time of abundance where the whole world will see a, an abundance of produce. People will be well off, will be living well. But then number two, there will be a year of famine. There will be some kind of lack that will precede some of the events of the throne judgment. Number three, a dark mist will cover the earth. Number four, Satan and the Antichrist are revealed. These will love the nation of the Hebrews the most. And it says the righteous will hide themselves from all of this, from this rule of Satan and the Antichrist and whatever is going on for this time period. This time period is explained as about a three-year period. Number five, all humanity will die and then arise at the sound of Gabriel's trumpet. Six, the cross and all holy implements like Bibles, uh, anything that represents God or Christ, uh, anything holy, will be lifted into the air and preserved from the destruction to come. Number seven, rivers and floods of fire from heaven will burn the whole earth. The earth will be laid waste. It will be purged and cleansed. All of the earth is flattened. Hills are brought low, valleys are raised, and made silent. The earth is completely silent for seven days. Number eight, the firmaments will pass away. And as it explains in one of the texts, it's because of a lack of water. As this fire is flowing from heaven, and apparently, according to these texts, the firmaments being made of water... The fire will somehow exhaust the firmaments of their water and the firmaments above that separate the levels of heaven will break apart or dissolve. Number nine, the stars will combine perhaps and then fall from heaven. Number 10, God will come down to the earth or near it in the sky. Number 11, Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem will come down to the cleansed earth. As one of the texts said, heaven is emptied. Number 12, all mankind will be gathered together before God in what is called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Number 13, God commands Hades to open and the souls of all dead humans, titans, giants, and watchers will come out and stand before God. Number 14, the bodies of the dead are reconstituted, meaning flesh is put back on their bodies for this judgment. Number 15, God will then take his throne. Number 16, Jesus will now be seen coming on the clouds with his angels and taking his throne at God's right hand. Number 17, then Jesus would be crowned by God. And the nations, the wicked nations, will weep over this. Number 18, the book of the deeds of man, which is sealed with seven seals, is apparently then opened by Christ. Number 19, during the judgment, the wicked are gathered at Christ's left hand, meaning the goats, according to the parable in the scriptures, while the righteous are gathered at Christ's right hand, the sheep. 
Number 20, the unrighteous Hebrews are going to be judged and then sent to the river of fire, the ones that killed Christ. Number 21, God commands the nations and the wicked to enter the river of fire. Number 22, the wicked are chastised forever in dark places by angels. Number 23, the righteous or the elect will be taken by angels through the river of fire, but then to Christ, and will not be devoured in the river of fire. Number 24. Angels gather the righteous and the elect to heaven and clothe them with the white raiment, the clothing of the life above. Number 25. The wicked will confess that God's punishment for them is just. Number 26. The righteous will be washed or baptized in the crystal sea, which is the Acherusian lake. Number 27, Christ takes the righteous into the everlasting kingdom in heaven. Number 28, Satan and the Antichrist are seized, bound, and thrown in the lake of fire. Number 29, the new or renewed earth is made one with paradise. It flourishes and it grows much fruit, and there are no boundaries. It is shared by all mankind, and there is no day and no night. Number 30. Finally, the righteous will be given the ability, possibly, to save people from the river of fire, and then to take them to a special place in heaven given by God. Of course, we saw a little conflict on that particular statement. Whether that's true or not is hard to tell. But that's it. That's the list of events that are talked about in these writings when it comes to the great white throne judgment. Uh, And that after this time of judgment, it would be time without end where humanity that had been saved because of their righteousness would live on the new earth with God and with Christ near the new Jerusalem, that it would all then be consummated, fulfilled, completely done and finished and that there would never be another tear in the eye all right now i wanted to take a segment here to just talk about this because i know that as i said in the beginning this is going to rub up against a lot of people's understandings of eschatology and times you know because what we're really talking about is the possibility that yes at the final judgment there is another coming so to speak of christ that has been talked about both in the bible and in all these other writings uh it may not it, that it's definitely not what the premillennial dispensationalist or protestant denominations talk about when they talk about the second coming but it, it does seem to be as i've said before uh and I've said it before, very unsure of myself, but now I'm very sure of myself that Christ would be involved at the great white throne judgment. Whether you call it the second coming or you call it his coming, that's what we're going to talk about in this section. Because this does raise the question, are there now two comings of Christ? In 70 AD, it seemed that there was a a coming of Christ. Uh, There are verses in the New Testament that talk about that people wouldn't die before you saw the Son of Man coming in the clouds, uh, things like that. And so now we have this question of, well, were there two comings? Um, Is there confusion now between the two? You know, and so I wanted to try to help with that a little bit and what I see here. So if we go to, for instance, Mark 14, verse 62... And then also in Matthew 26, 64, Jesus is talking to the high priest, Caiaphas. And in Mark, he says, Ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Well, this is, this is Caiaphas. Now, the question is, is he talking about 70 AD? Uh, because there was an amazing event that occurred in 70 AD, obviously. What we read in the history books is signs. There were lots of signs and wonders in the heavens. There was this 
amazing battle between the Roman armies and Israel uh, or the Hebrews uh, in Jerusalem where there was this huge siege and all these amazing things just happened. Miraculous things in many ways. You know, and, and, and preterists will explain 70 AD as a literal coming of Christ. And so this raises a lot of questions for myself as a partial preterist and for others as whatever your persuasion may be. But were there two comings? Were there two comings? It does seem to be that when Christ said these things in the New Testament, it seems like he was talking about 70 AD because he said to Caiaphas and others that you are going to see it. Uh, it sounds like he's saying, before you die, I'm coming in the clouds. But the signs were there. The signs were there that there was a huge judgment against Israel, against the Jews, uh, and all the miraculous things that happened. So the question is, well, were there two comings? Should we call that his second coming? Should we call that his first coming? Should we call them both comings? We can tell from the passages we've read today in this, this video that the coming of Christ at the great white throne judgment was called a coming by the earliest Christians and by all of these writings, uh, that, that at Christ's coming, the quick and the dead, the living and dead, would all be judged. Everyone would be judged. Of course, this did not happen in 70 AD. So we know there's a difference between these two comings. It's obvious in the texts, okay? So here's what, what my thoughts are on this. You know, many partial preterists will talk about the two comings because they do believe in two comings. They'll call the one coming in 70 AD a coming in judgment, and they call the, the second coming that they're talking about a coming in glory. So they'll say that's the two comings, the coming in judgment, the coming in glory. And I tend to take a little bit of issue with that just because it seems like the second coming they're talking about, if that's what we've been reading about, the great white throne judgment, that's a judgment as well. Although those writings, the writings we've read tonight, do talk about him coming in glory uh, before all men to judge all mankind. And so... I wouldn't exactly describe it the way that partial preterists typically, I've heard them describe it before as one coming in judgment in 70 AD and a coming in glory at the end. And I will admit wholeheartedly that I've been challenged recently to go back to some of the partial preterist teachers that I know of and really relearn, understand what they are teaching. Are they teaching about the great white throne judgment as the second coming? Or are they teaching about something else? Are they teaching about rapture in the second coming? Or are they teaching about something else? Some of these little nuanced details I'm not sure about of, of what other people teach. But what I'm starting to understand here myself is that it does seem that 70 AD was a type of coming. And the great white throne judgment, as we've read in these writings, was the coming that most of Christianity talked about, most of Christianity, including pre-Christian, pre-Christ, and at the time of Christ, and afterwards. That was definitely talked about, even by Christ himself. So here's what I am postulating, maybe theorizing, on the why there seems to have been two comings. Why would that be? It doesn't make sense. You know, especially preterists will argue against that. They're going to, you know, probably already like have turned off this video. They're probably like, I can't, no, there weren't two comings or whatever they're going to say. Even though I've just read about, you know, 60 different passages that talk about this coming, coming, this future coming of Christ at the end of time for the judgment of all mankind. Uh, but nevertheless, preterists won't like that. So this, this two coming idea needs an explanation, I think. And here's what I have been wondering as I've learned this stuff and been also challenged with this. I know you guys have probably heard me teach often about the Mosaic Law and what Israel was about 
what was the law about? It was not only to show Israel their sin, but it also precursored Christ. And it precursored many different prophecies, not just of Christ, but of things in history, including, I believe, the last days and the time after the last days, the time that's unending where people would be with God in the end. And so I think you, if you've listened to me teach and you've read the Bible and you've seen the correlation between all of the practices of Israel, the reason God had the nation, the correlations and signs that were given based on throughout the history of Israel that corresponded to Christ and other events in history in their future. If that was God's purpose, for Israel, then would the judgment of Israel been any different? So what I'm saying is this. If the history of the Israeli people was assigned to the nations, to all nations of earth, about God, about who he is, about Christ and the redemption that was coming, if all of that and the nation of Israel was all about God showing everyone all of this information about who he was and what was coming, wouldn't we also think that same thing about the judgment that God brought upon Israel, the judgment of the Roman armies coming in and destroying Jerusalem? And at that time, Christ's coming in the clouds as a part of the fulfillment of all of that. Just as we've seen in many of the feasts, I just did the feasts video on the feasts in the Mosaic Law and what they correlate to in history and the ages of humanity and the end and then after the end. Wouldn't this judgment in 70 AD and his coming at that time be also a precursor to what was coming at the end of time? So would that coming be a precursor, a signification of what was going to happen at the end of time? Because we know that not all of the things prophesied for the great white throne judgment, we know for a fact that they all did not happen in 70 AD. But was the 70 AD judgment and coming of Christ a precursor, a sign for all humanity, for all time, for all nations, to understand what's going to happen in the end, a severe judgment by God. The judgment of Israel was a signification of the judgment of all mankind. Again, just like he signified Christ himself with the feasts and the sacrifices beforehand. Uh, I mean, I can't even go into all of it, but so much of history was signified with Israeli people. I believe that that judgment and his coming in 70 AD was also a signification of the final judgment that has been talked about in countless writings like the ones we've gone over tonight. I tend to think that it was, that that is exactly what 70 AD was. It was absolutely a fulfillment of prophecy. Many of the prophecies for the Israeli people, for the Jews. But... Again, just like everything with the Jews, it signified the overarching history of all mankind and the judgment that would be coming at the end of time. So, I hope you've had a blast with all this information. It's a lot. I get it. Thank you for sticking with me through this. I hope that it has challenged you because I think that that's what it needs to do. I do believe that because of the breadth of the information I've shared with you, we went through so many writings, both Christian, pre-Christian, biblical, that all talk about the same thing. Even through church history, this idea of the coming of Christ at the end of time with God, with his angels, in judgment of all mankind, was known. It was recorded and kept through the history of the church, even in the creeds of the churches up through the Reformation. You know, wouldn't it be better for us to believe that that most of the beliefs we're talking about were preserved in Christianity, maybe skewed from time to time, maybe confused, especially with the coming of dispensationalism 
and Zionism uh, in the, the last couple centuries or two, those things probably skewed our understanding of these prophecies quite heavily. But it seems like throughout history that these prophecies of the end of time, the judgment of all mankind, were preserved for us. And that they were held by Christians throughout almost all of Christian history. So I would encourage you to take what I have shared with you and let it challenge you. Think about it. Go over it. Research a little for yourself. I did not read all of these passages that talk about this. I didn't. I also stopped my research short of finding all the other passages out there that talk about this because I know there's more, but I have to at some point stop and make a video. So I just encourage you that if you know this, this beats up against your beliefs, it challenges you, that you really have to wrestle with the material, not with me. You need to wrestle with all of these writings. You're going to have to figure out how to explain why all of these writings are saying the same thing and why Christ echoed the same thing in what he said in the Gospels and that the apostles wrote the same things in the New Testament you're going to have to explain and figure out why you don't believe those things to be true and why all the church creeds from Nicene until the Westminster Confessions contain this information in them. So don't hold it against me for taking the writings as they are and presenting them. And in the next couple of videos I do, it's going to be this times a hundred there are some things that are going to challenge you and please allow that challenge to occur and let yourself work on it work towards it understand it don't dismiss it because i believe that the things we've read about and talked about in this video are true and that they are going to occur i do believe that 100 percent i have no reason not to especially when i have the whole body of Christianity throughout the ages behind me in that belief. I hope this has been enjoyable for you. I will look forward to hear what some of your thoughts are if you want to comment on this. I just appreciate your time in putting forth the effort to listen, to understand, to read and understand more, to grow. And uh, that's the only thing I want for myself. So, uh, so take care. And God bless you in your research.